Okay. Okay, so um, biblical preaching, uh, we'll start from where we uh, left off in our last class. We looked at the different ways by which we can study the Word of God. Okay, uh, so in each um, each method uh, has its purpose and achieves a certain purpose. Right, we looked at that. Um, the we also said we also there, there was a small work to be done over the weekend, but I don't see any submissions. I saw um, like. Uh, uh, Jeffina had actually given me the uh, hard copy. She showed me what she has done, what word study. Um, well, what we do is we'll take some more time, maybe today, and uh, you can post it on the classwork. Okay, you can upload it on the classwork uh, section. Uh, so uh, the work was that the assignment was that you would do a word study. Right, you can pick any word. Um, no worries. Um, yeah, so it's it's not graded. It just wanted us to you know get into the uh, habit of doing it. I mean, just to try it out so that all of us will be uh, aware. Okay, this is, this is something that we can do. So um, uh, to do a, a study of the word, uh, to find out the meaning of the word, to find out where it applies or where it comes, um, you know, in scripture. And uh, so you can look into the, you know, if it's in the Old Testament, we can look into the the Hebrew, the the New Testament. You can look into the the, the Greek and and uh, and also a few, a few verses. Maybe not, I mean, it, you know, it, it'll be too vast if you want to consider all the scripture. So uh, just for us to uh, learn, okay, this is the application. And uh, if it's something that you knew that you've learned, uh, you know, to be able to share that as well, right? So that was the uh, that's the thing. We we said we'll we'll do that okay so you so take some time and uh, you know maybe in our next class thursday when we when we meet we can look at that right uh, we can um, i'd like to just go through some of yours right? so jeffina has done on cornerstone okay so cornerstone is already taken <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter if you're thinking of uh, you know such words it's fine so so like we said uh, said it's uh, it can be um, you know when we when we're looking at these words it can be uh, uh, it can be a word study. It can be a topical study also. The word study can be a topic. For example, it can be uh, you know like love or faith. Uh, it's a topic also, right? Faith is a topic uh, by itself. So it can be that. Um, so that is what it is, right? So word study it does take time because you're looking at the meaning. You're looking at uh, the original language. Uh, you can consider all that and some of the tools that we can use, you know, uh, like uh, what I shared last class, you can use uh, eSword, you can use, uh, you know, any other commentaries. Um, well, there's something called the Blue Letter Bible by David Guzik, um, which is, again, a good commentary to have. Um, uh, you can use that as well. Okay, so we looked at uh, different kinds. Let me just share the notes here. Yeah. Okay, so we we looked at all that, the word study, the topical study, the character study. Um, then we looked at the book study and also the inductive uh, study method, right? So um, so all this, uh, you know, really enriches the way we can study the word of God um, and uh, we can, it, it really helps us, right? So um, when we do, um, you know, we looked at the book study, the book study really, you know, if you're a minister of God who is, you know, you're pastoring a church and you are, uh, you know, uh, doing a book study, it really, uh, you know, helps the congregation come to a place of uh, being well-read uh, and also having a firm grounding on the word of God. Right. So, um, so you could consider, you know, doing a a book study uh, for the congregation. You know, it's it's really um, it's it's really good. So the congregation is enriched. They are built up. You know, it's it's not just uh, they're looking at the uh, 
verse per se, you know, out of context, but they are actually, um, they, they come to a place of uh, understanding the context, um, totally being enriched, uh, and also uh, it will result in a well-read congregation. Of course, it depends on individuals, how they, you know, receive the word and so on. So, um, so as ministers of God, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's good to uh, do a book study, you know, or, or do a book study ourselves and and lead the congregation in a book study right uh, now that's again going to take some time it's going to take a few sundays or maybe a few uh, months right to go through these books but it will it will really result uh, it will have its uh, benefits right okay um so then we looked at inductive right Indu inductive uh, study so um let me let me just. Uh, I, I know we looked at the questions. Uh, let me just look at uh, you know maybe a couple of steps that we can take. So I'm just backing up a little bit, just to share. You know what are those steps that we can take? Okay, uh, one is observation. Okay, if we are studying that passage, um, we will observe what is in the text even before we ask these you know question. We'll observe. And then the second step would be to ask those questions, right? Which is uh, um, to to interpret. The question leads to interpretation, so uh, we ask those questions. And um, and 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 very interesting questions, you know. What and what we shared, what is there in the notes, is is a representation of that. Okay, just a sample size of uh, some of the questions that we can ask, and then. Of course, it results in application. Okay. Now, I just wanted to say that um, you know all these methods of study. You know, we, we are, you know, just like how we looked at the, the rules in hermeneutics or interpretation. Uh, we are, of course, relying on on God. You know, relying on the Spirit of God, Holy Spirit, to lead us, to give us light, to give us illumination, to give us revelation, and He will do that. Okay, and uh, and and that's the best part. You know, it could be scripture that we have read so many times, but he gives us a fresh understanding, a fresh revelation of it. Uh, and um, and and I, I think that and the beautiful thing is this: um, even as we, um, you know, uh, if you look at a simple text like Psalm twenty-three, right? Uh, there's so much that that God can actually, the Holy Spirit can actually illuminate to our hearts. Um, for example, you know, our certain emphasis that he can bring. Uh, like if you look at um, Psalm 23, you're saying it's a, the verse one says, "The Lord is my shepherd; I shall not want." Okay, the Lord is my shepherd; I shall not lack any good thing. Well, that's what it means. So the the Lord can really, the Holy Spirit can really illuminate to our hearts and lay an emphasis about the first part of it. You know, just the first two words, "The Lord." Okay, so. Uh, so bringing a focus to the fact that he is the shepherd, the Lord is the shepherd, um, and uh, and no one else. Okay, so the focus on the Lord Himself, um, and and uh, and if you just break it down, you know, he can. There's so many possibilities, right? Just in that one verse, uh, and then the third word there is is the Lord is, meaning it's it's not in some time in the past or somewhere. You know, or it's going to be in the future, but the Lord is, you know, present tense. He is my shepherd. And if you look at the fourth word, you know, it says my, which means it's it's not someone else's all the time. It's not, you know, my neighbor. It's it's my he's my shepherd. You're personalizing. So the Lord can give so much uh, it, for our human minds, you know, we we see this, right? So when we're doing an inductive study. Uh, when we're saying, what does this passage say? What does this passage mean? When you look at that verse, there's so much we can glean. We can take out of that just that one verse, right? And 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 to top it all, uh, the uh, God, the Holy Spirit, can bring illumination for each and every aspect of it, each and every part of that just that one verse, right? So um, there's so much that can happen through uh, each of these studies, okay? Uh, but all these studies also have their limitations. We need to understand that, right? Um, right, because uh, you you are asking you know some questions, uh, and um, 
uh, you're focusing on the text and you're limiting yourself to the text here when you're looking at an inductive study. Um, so they, they have their limitations, right? Uh, we need to understand that. They have their, uh, uh, maybe the, a better way to say it, it has its scope, okay? It has its scope, you know, this is what a word study will do, uh, which uh, a topical study can do, go, maybe go further, uh, and a word study can be part of a topical study. Or, you know, this is what uh, uh, a character study will do. But character study also has its scope, has, which means it has its uh, uh, sphere of what, what it can actually do. And it also means that it cannot do certain other things. You know, that is also there. Okay, So we need to uh, just be mindful of that. That is all. But each has its purpose. And uh, it's, it's great if we can do that, uh, you know. OK. So just to touch upon just one aspect of, um, you know, again, hermeneutics as we are studying, uh, maybe we're doing a book study, maybe we're doing an inductive study, you know, what if there is a passage uh, and there seems to be, you know, conflicting ideas in that passage, or we see this verse and seems to have conflicting, uh, you know, ideas. Um, and, uh, and then what do, how do we deal with that? Right? How do we how do we interpret that? Okay, so here are some few thoughts. You know, we're not going to uh, take a passage and actually go through it, but we're just going to go through uh, you know some of these things. Okay, one is you identify the problem in the passage. Okay, and what is that opposing view, which makes it a problem? Okay, so and uh, an example could be um, you know something that. Uh, we see in 1 Corinthians what we learned in, uh, you know, 1 Corinthians, what we learned in the Holy Spirit class. Um, 1 Corinthians, let's say, look at 14. Um, and then Paul is talking about the gifts of the Spirit, how you need to use the gifts and all that. 1 Corinthians 14, and then it's uh, verse 34, it says, let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak but they are to be submissive, as, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands in church. I'm sorry, at home, for it is shameful for women to speak in church. Okay. Now that's a. I mean, that's a. Right there, you know, that's, that's a problem there, right? So even before that, he says you can all prophesy one by one. And he says, you know, um, uh, he's, he's talking about praying in tongues. He's talking about, um, you know, if. Verse 24, he says, if all prophesy and an unbeliever comes and, and so on. So, you know, what does he mean here? I'd let you women keep silent in the church. So obviously it's talking about something very specific, right? So so it that will help us, you know, to say, okay, what is the opposing view? Opposing view is that he wants everybody to pray, he wants everybody to prophesy, he wants everybody to, uh, you know, learn. And, and so which means that, I cannot jump to the conclusion and say, if you're a woman, then you have to keep quiet in church. You know, I can't come to that conclusion, right? So why? Because I'm I'm looking at the opposing view, okay? And uh, and well, it's, there's a problem because of the opposing view. So I can't come to the immediate conclusion and say, okay, and build a you know, a doctrine on this, build a teaching on this, right? Okay, so list the realistic alternative interpretations, omit omitting the obviously unrealistic interpretations, okay? So what are the alternatives? Maybe he's talking about, uh, 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 well, the unrealistic alternative could be, well, women have to keep, you know, keep silent. But what are the other options? Option is okay. Maybe at a particular time they are supposed to keep silent. Maybe he's he's talking about something else altogether. Maybe he's talking about women asking questions, interrupting this church service. Um, maybe it is something that was only for those women at that time in Corinth, right? Something that we cannot apply today. You know, all these options are there, right? So we uh, we we look at that. Okay. The third thing is to write out the thought development of the entire book. Okay, if it's a if it's a short book, the entire book, or if it is a long book, then you look at that thought development of the passage. Okay, so what is he saying from one Corinthians twelve 
13, 14, he's addressing something very important in the church. And um, he's, he's talking about spiritual gifts while he's talking about, you know, several things he's, he's addressed already about idolatry. He's already addressed about, um, you know, how we cannot be carnal. He's already talked about marriage. Uh, it's all these things. And he's talking about spiritual gifts. He's saying, I don't want you to be ignorant. And he's, uh, you know, talking about how one should use these gifts, right? So, so we, we see this, oh, it applies to everybody who is in the church, right? So it's it's uh, it's something that he's talking about. So this is the thing, and whatever he's putting down is for all believers in the church. Okay, so so we we look at that, we come to that conclusion. Yeah, you know, it, it, well, this verse seems to be a little problematic, but then we see that this is the thought pattern. He's addressing the entire church in all this how the gift should be used um, and also uh, we come to a very interesting conclusion okay this is not the only place where he's saying keep silent right there are other places where he's keeping silent right he says um, you know uh, about prophesying also he's saying you you know if you don't have anything with you then you just keep silent um, there are other other things that, other places where he's saying you know, uh, let him be silent in the church. So it's we look at that also. We we consider that also. Okay, what are the other instances? Where he's saying you know keep keep silent. Um, so we we study that. Okay, um, like for example, you know verse twenty eight. He says you know if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in church. Okay, so there also he's saying let him let them keep silent. Okay, verse thirty also he's saying if if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first one keep silent. Okay, that's another place. And here he's saying let the women keep silent. So, um, so we see that it's okay. There are other places where he's instructing in the very same passage. Okay, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, very same passage. He's addressing other things, so we'll study that. Okay, then check the historical background of the book. Okay, what is uh, what is the history of that place? What was actually happening uh, during that time? Um, was this particular group that he's addressing were they prone to certain things? Were they prone prone to doing things culturally in a gathering that Paul had to write this? Right, those are some things that you can look at and the historical background clarifies it okay so you see that it's a gentile church non-jewish church unchurched which means that they did not have um uh they were they were not they not did not grow up grew up um, you know they did not grow up in a particular that kind of a setting they're all adults and then they just they they've come to know the lord that's it that is it and so he is he has to tell them a little more how it should be and uh, you see that he's going to be writing about uh, uh, he's already written about uh, uh, you know head covering uh, that's another thing right so so you see that uh, you understand that from the historical background okay this is this kind of church um, and then oh the women um, they were this temple uh, temple of um, you know, where there was temple prostitutes. Uh, the prostitutes of that day, um, they actually shaved their heads. Even the temple priests or the temple prostitutes, they shaved their head. Um, and so, you know, he's, he's when it comes to head covering, he's talking about that. And this is the kind of uh, audience that he is, uh, the original audience to whom he's writing. Okay, so they, then that helps in the interpretation. Okay, then, Identify keywords and perform perform word studies on them. Okay, so find out what the keywords are. Uh, hey, you can maybe study what does this um, keep silent mean? Okay, or uh, is there something about uh, words that he's using there that I can understand? You know, about speaking. Um, is there a difference? Okay, there there are there seem to be different words. There are words like Lego, which means you you're speaking. Or you're saying some things 
uh, you know, line upon line, logical uh, thing. And then there's another word called leleo, leleo, L-A-L-E-O, which means that uh, it's just a, a random thing that you're speaking. You're just talking about the weather. You're talking about the, you know, the price of the produce in the market. So what is he referring to? Is he talking about Lego or was he, was he talking about leleo? Right. So you find those keywords and we can do word studies and uh, we can use a concordance. We can use, um, OK, check the words, uses of words in the same book. Check the use of the words in, the, in another book um, and how it is used by the other authors uh, in the New Testament. Right. So all this will be helpful. Okay. Uh, I'm not going into much detail because you've already dealt with this in hermeneutics uh, class. Okay. So list the pro and con of evidence for each interpretation. Evaluate the weight of each uh, interpretation and evidence. Okay. Um, spell out the application. Now the thing is, okay, you have this uh, interpretation. Um, what would the application be? Now, if I go with this, okay, we would have to keep silent. How would it apply to the original audience? Okay. How would it apply for churches everywhere? How would it apply, for example, you know, where you have a church where the fivefold ministry, you know, we know that it's not uh, limited to just men, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. We know that it's the word that he uses there, that he and he gave gifts to men. We know it's for mankind. We know it's, it's not talking about the gender men, right? So how would it apply there? How can they fulfill their calling by being silent in the church? Right? So you spell out their application. And maybe for your own personal life and ministry, you know for sure that God has called you to, you know, to be a you know, whatever prophet or evangelist, and then and you're saying, okay, we're not to be silent. How do I do that? Right? So you know that okay, it's something more. Okay, and then we come to the conclusion of course you know uh, for those of us who are wondering okay can women finally what are you saying can they speak or not you know we've dealt with this in detail about women in ministry so you can you know look at that consider that um, and I think you will be also uh, looking at it uh, in the minist uh, ministry of the pastor evangelist teacher uh, you'll be studying that in detail right about women in ministry um, so, so yeah, so so we leave it at that, right? Um, so to come to that conclusion, when we are studying, when we are coming to um, uh, interpreting the word, it's it's very uh, it's crucial. Uh, why is it crucial? Because right believing or right interpretation, Paul says, no, rightly divide the word of God. Okay, he tells uh, Timothy. Rightly divide the word of God because if you're going to divide the word of God, meaning going to you know understand, go further, deeper, and uh, you know going to uh, derive this meaning from the word of God, Paul also says, give yourself entirely to them, to it. Right. So when you give yourself entirely, there's going to be change. Um, you're going to be you know right believing leads to right. Uh, action or right living right? because when you believe something then your mind is renewed to it right when your mind is renewed to it or aligned to it then your thoughts then your choices then your actions and everything is in line with that so it's very important so if, if I'm I'm just using this example if if as a believer if I'm going to believe that okay women cannot be used in ministry or, uh, or, or women cannot be used, women should not speak in church, then I'm going to be enforcing that. I'm going to be teaching that you know, as a minister. Right? And not only is my life impacted by it, by this particular thing that I'm speaking, uh, that I'm teaching as a truth, but others' lives are also going to be greatly impacted. Right? God places me as an overseer, as a shepherd, and uh, to feed people with knowledge and understanding. But with this kind of deficient understanding, I'm, you know, I'm feeding, I'm, I'm nurturing, and people's lives are impacted by it. Uh, instead of, uh, well, 
instead sort of discovering the fullness of call, discovering God's purpose, then I'm really stunting. I'm limiting, I, you know, people from stepping into the fullness of the call that God has for them. Right. So, right believing is very important, and even before that, you know, rightly dividing the word of God is very important. That's why Paul writes over and over again, actually, to um, to Timothy, and he's saying, you know, reject uh, fables, reject what is being falsely called knowledge. Um, you know, he, that's the first thing he writes, right? In verse three, he said, "I charge that uh, you, that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine." He says, you know, that you may charge some. In the sense, it, it's it's a charge, it's a command, so saying, you know, don't. You have to tell people that they should not teach any other thing. Uh, what are the other things they were teaching? Verse four talks about that: fables, genealogies, and, and some other things, uh, which had this, you know, which had this, um, what trappings of what is called truth, but it was not. And because of that, there were endless disputes, which was what was supposed to liberate people was actually bringing people into bondage and causing a lot of disputes. So Paul, very clearly, he says, oh, this is what you must do. Um, the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, you know, good conscience, sincere faith. And, uh, you know, you stray from it, then you get into idle talk. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not it's, it's it's not good. It's not constructive at all. Okay, right. So um, let's look at um, uh, the next chapter, where we're just going to look at how did the Lord Jesus minister the word. Okay, so the Lord Jesus, our example, how did he minister the word? In what manner did he um, did he, did he minister the word? You know, he he was uh, he is the living word. And when he you know, walked or ministered on the earth during his earthly ministry, like how did he minister the word? So from that also, now we looked at the, some of the practical aspects of, okay, um, these are the ways by which I can study the word of God. Okay, so now when it comes to ministering the word of God, we also looked at, you know, um, what is what, what should we look at when it comes to the objectives of ministering the word? Okay, so that's how we started, right? The importance of ministering the word, the objectives of uh, of the uh, the word, ministering the word, and, uh, and and all that. What is the word of God? You know, when we minister the word of God, how important it is to minister the word of God, right? So we're looking at uh, today. Um, okay, how did the Lord Jesus? How did he minister? Okay, so some very interesting insights we can get from that. The first thing that we see is that, uh, well, uh, from Isaiah 50, verse 4 and 5, we see that um, he it was a word in season. Right? He ministered a word in season. Um, it is a prophetic uh, uh, verse here. It, it talks about um, how he, he will, the Messiah will speak a word in season. Okay, so it says here, there was four, the Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. Okay, So a timely word or a word in season. Okay. I'm sure that you know many times in our own lives where we have received a timely word where we say, "I don't know how this happened, but that was just for me." Okay, it was a timely word. It was, it was just for me. It did something. It warned me, and the word of God maybe prevented me or just liberated me. It was a timely word. Right. And uh, you know, when I think about it, I'm just uh, I'm just reminded of um, this particular service where I don't know if I shared it before, but uh, I just want to repeat it. This service where we were um, leading in worship, it was at uh, uh, you know at APC Central, it was meeting at an older location. So um, we were singing some of these songs, and one of the songs was um, uh, "God is Fighting for Us." Right, that song. God is fighting for us. And in that, there's a bridge which says, God is fighting. Um, uh, and the chorus, which goes uh, always, you know, I will live 
and not die and declare uh, and, and so on right so i will not will not die so we, we kind of repeated that chorus a few times uh, i remember during that um, time uh, that's that service and and after the service um, actually the following week that monday or a tuesday we get an email saying that uh, um, you know this this person who had actually attended the service uh, she she wanted to take her own life she wanted to end it all Okay, so she came to the service. She, she just thought, okay, there's too many problems in life. Uh, I'm, I don't know where to begin to solve them. Um, you know, I don't know where to start. Uh, so I'm, I'm, she just came to the conclusion, I'm going to take my life, right? I'm going to end it all. But before that, let me just attend the service. So I don't know how, how she came there, and uh, we don't know that. But then she came. And uh, this... The words of this song, you know, this scripture, right? I will, I will live and declare uh, the glory of God in the land of the living, like from the Psalms. So this ministered to her, and she, uh, after the service, uh, she went back a changed person. She was, uh, she went back with hope, uh, with faith, uh, and her will being strengthened. Uh, that, yes, you know the. With God, she can face it. Like God is fighting for her, she can face it. So she came in back and wrote that, uh, hey, the, the problems have not changed. You know, the problems are still there, but there's something in me. Uh, I went with this particular thing that uh, I came with this mindset, but I went out of the service knowing fully well that uh, I don't want to end it all, but God is fighting for me and I will live. I will declare the glory of God in the land of the living. Okay, so. Well, we see that um, it was a timely word for her. Okay, a timely word. A timely word uh, actually is sometimes life and death. It's a matter of life and death uh, in, in the lives of people. So here it says, The Lord has given me the tongue of the learned that, how, how, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is. Weary. So the Lord will give a timely word, and the Lord Jesus spoke a timely word to those who were weary. Okay, um, and uh, and you see the process. Like He gives the tongue of the learned, and it applies to us as well, right? Um, that we should know how to speak a word in season, and the process is this: He awakens us, He awakens our ear to hear as the learned. So if we are willing, like if we are willing, if we are sensitive, the Lord wants to speak that word. So, so the beautiful thing is this, and he knows what is the need. He knows what is the need. Right? He knows who are the people. He knows what their needs are. So we don't have to put ourselves under a lot of pressure. Right? All we have to do is be sensitive, be willing, be obedient, uh, even as he speaks to us and, and makes us sensitive to speak a timely word. Okay. And sometimes the thing is this, you know, we, we wonder, God, it, this is so simple. Give me something more complex. I want, I want to speak something which is complex. I want to speak something which is deep. So there's nothing wrong you know, wanting to share some deep revelation. But sometimes, you know, God gives that word and uh, we are just blown away by the simplicity of it. And at the same time, we think, okay, will this actually do the job? Right? Will this do the job? Uh, but the thing is this, God who knows the needs of the people, God who knows the hearts of the people, God who knows the thoughts of the people, right? When he gives us the word, uh, you can be sure you know, and uh, yes, it involves taking that step of faith. It involves taking that risk in ministering that word, right? But it a timely word uh, is something that is required for someone who is weary. It is a word in season. It can be a matter of life and death for that person, right? Okay, so uh, the Lord Jesus spoke a timely word. Second thing that we see is that he spoke what he heard the father speak. 
Okay, John chapter eight verses twenty six to twenty twenty eight. Okay, the Lord saying this: I have many things to say. Um, I have many things to say and to judge concerning you. But he who sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I heard from him. Okay, so the son is hearing what the father has to say, and he is speaking. Okay, so they did not understand that he spoke to them of the father. Then Jesus said to them, when you lift up the son of man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my father taught me, I speak these things. Um, the previous chapter, uh, you know, it says, now in the, about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up to the temple and taught, and the Jews marveled. How does this man know letters, having never studied? Jesus answered and said, to, and answered them and said, "My doctrine is not mine, but His who sent me." Okay, so uh, he was always watching, he was always listening, and he spent extended times in the presence of the Father. Like we know, like the times of prayer, uh, he left. You know, he woke up early uh, before everyone else could, and he went up to those mountain and went up to the mountain and he prayed. Sometimes he spent whole nights in prayer on the mountain. Um, so we see that the whole ministry unfolding. You know, it was a very busy day. You know, uh, I think we looked at some of those scriptures. You know, very busy day of ministry, but we see that he has heard the Father, he has spoken to the Father, and. Uh, and he ministered what he heard the father speak. So, and a lesson for us over there that for us to be sensitive, for us to, you know, lean not in our own understanding, but to lean, to depend uh, on the Holy Spirit to hear what he is speaking. Okay. Okay. The third thing, John chapter 7 again, you know, says, now some of them uh, wanted to take him. But no one laid hands on it. He's talking about the people who were sent to arrest um, the officers, um, the security, the soldiers who were sent. Now, they, they wanted to, but they did not lay hands. Verse 45, then the officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, why have you not brought him? Verse 46, the officers answered, no one ever spoke like this man. Okay, so they, 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 they whatever, whatever he shared, they were, they were astonished. They marveled at some of the things that he spoke. And when you know they were watching, they were watching the exchange, the question and the answers that he gave, and they said, no one ever spoke like this man. Okay, Matthew thirteen. When he had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get his wisdom? And these mighty works. Okay, So you see that combination of wisdom and mighty works. Right? Wisdom, supernatural wisdom, supernatural works. And uh, so um, wisdom, whatever he shared, whatever he, uh, the word that he ministered was characterized by wisdom. Okay, so um, not earthly wisdom, but you know, with heavenly wisdom. Right. So, so we see that. Okay. Then the other thing that um, what they observed was that he spoke with authority. Okay. Luke four thirty one and thirty two. Then he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbath, and they were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with authority okay so uh, so what does that mean so that they, it did something to them as they heard this this notice that something was very very different it was real it was authentic and it came with authority as as if it, it was as if you know they whenever, whenever he said hey this is this is what it is they they it came with so much authority and power that they knew that it was the truth they couldn't refute it Right, so it says that they were astonished at his teaching. Um, so that is that is something that we see in Luke chapter four. Okay, um, he, he spoke with authority. Um, right, so 
even in Luke chapter 4, uh, verse 22 also talks about um, how they bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. Gracious words, words of authority. You know, verse 32 talks about the fact that his word was with authority. Verse 22 says that they were gracious words. So it was a it was an amazing mix of authority and uh, you know words being gracious, and it it was something that cannot be refuted. Okay. And uh, it was with authority uh, because, you know, you read further after verse 32, it says, Now in the synagogue, there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, Let us alone. What are we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him, in their midst, it came out of, out of him and did not hurt him. Then they were all amazed and spoke among themselves, saying, What a word this is! Okay, what a word this is! For with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the report about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. Okay, so we see that, yeah, he spoke with authority. He knew what he was talking about. It was the truth. It is something that he could testify to. He had heard the father speak, and it was with authority. And, uh, and, and that authority, which they could see themselves, it's not just something that, you know, they heard. Okay, somebody was eloquent. Somebody was speaking with a lot of nice things. It was demonstrated. Okay, so we saw that it was demonstrated. He and they said, "What a word is this that he commands the demons, uh, unclean spirits, and they come out." Okay, so he spoke with authority, um, and uh, and this is again in the words of the Lord Jesus. We see that he ministered with humility. He ministered with a meek heart. Right? So Matthew eleven twenty eight twenty nine. The Lord says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Okay, so saying, okay, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, which means just come into agreement with me. Choose to walk with me. Choose to learn. Uh, take my yoke. And learn from me okay and he describes okay for i am gentle and i am lowly in heart okay so so uh, his ministering his teaching we could say it was with such humility and uh, it, it was not about the self it was not with pride um, it was with humility okay so we learn that as well okay uh, and say okay the lord jesus ministered in such a manner and um, you know, when we look at John chapter 14, it says, okay, the things that I do, the others will do also. We have him uh, whom we can follow, we can imitate. Uh, and so also we have his ministry as a template for us. Okay. As an example, as a pattern for us. Um, many times we look at the world around, what is the current trend? You know, in what way are they ministering and what we are they teaching okay um, which is fine but then this supersedes all that right he ministered with a meek heart okay um proverbs 16 21 the wise in heart will be called prudent the sweetness of lips increases learning okay um a few other things that we see is that um, well he used the old testament scriptures he used the you know scripture of that day which was from the Old Testament, and we use several references. You know, if you just look, if you just read through, you know, if you have a maybe a lead, red letter version where the words of the Lord Jesus are in red, you know, you see that the kind of verses that he, you know, quoted and he quotes, he quotes from Isaiah, he quotes from, you know, uh, everywhere, and uh, you see his, uh, you see the references there, right there. He quoted scripture. Right, from the Old Testament, he quoted over and over again. 
Okay. Then he used it, used parables and illustrations. Okay. So that's another thing. He made things simple. Okay. Like he knew a lot of things. He had seen, he had heard from the father the truth, but he communicated the truth in a very simple way. He communicated the truth with parables. Um, let's say Matthew 13 or Mark chapter 4 talks about the parable of the sower. He was communicating something very, very significant about the word of God. Um, but he communicated that with a parable. And, um, you know, they could not, or I'm sure that they would not forget that lesson ever. Every time they looked at the fields, every time they looked at a sower, they were reminded of this teaching of the Lord Jesus, because for them it was an everyday thing, right? They uh, sowing and everything would happen, so they would they could see it right before their eyes, right? And uh, every time they saw that, it was an object lesson for them. It was a life lesson. They saw it, and they could not, uh, you know, they they could not forget um, this lesson about the sowing. Um, the word of God being sown, the kind of uh, thing that was uh, was coming against the word, and uh, to take away the word, and what our responsibility is, and the kind of um, uh, increase that the word brings, right? Fruitfulness the word brings. Okay, we also see that um, the power of God was present. So it was not theory; it was not some nice things, nice ideas but it was in demonstration of power. Okay, that passage that we saw just now, uh, we saw that, well, he spoke with authority and with the word he commanded. Uh, Luke chapter 5 talks about, um, you know, how he, um, uh, let's look, 5 and verse 17, says that the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Okay, um, the, uh, the, the first part of the verse talks about on a certain day, he was teaching, there were Pharisees and teachers sitting by, and it says that the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Okay, if you look at the very next verse, verse 18, and behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. Uh, and then it, that whole miracle, right? the Lord saying, uh, sins are forgiven you, and uh, and everything that happened after that. Right. So the power of the Lord was was present. The power of God was present um, in his life, in his ministry. And this is how he ministered the word. So lesson for us, power of God, the supernatural works of God need not be or should not be separated from the ministry of the word. Okay. So uh, from our preaching, from our pulpit ministry, from our maybe small group ministry, maybe even one-on-one -on -one Bible lessons, just invite, just expect the power of the God, power of God. Right? It can be in very different ways. It can be in physical change. It can be in emotional change. It can be in, you know, character change. Whatever life transformation, but expect the power of God, right, um, to work and move in faith. He ministered out of compassion. The last one, Mark six and verse thirty-four. He ministered out of compassion. He was moved with compassion. So what does that mean? He was he ministered out of compassion. He came out, uh, let me just read that verse. Uh, Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude, and was moved with compassion for them, because they were like sheep not having a shepherd. So he be began to teach them many things. Okay, so so what does that show us really? Right. What does that show us? That he was engaged, he was involved. Right? He was not aloof, he was not disengaged from his audience. He was involved, he was engaged. And he was moved with compassion. He saw them, he saw their how they were, and he was moved with he saw their spiritual condition really. They were like sheep without shepherd. He was moved with compassion and he spent time with them teaching them 
Okay, so that's something that's a very important lesson for us because we can actually preach, we can actually minister without compassion. We can actually preach and minister saying, okay, I need to finish this. Uh, we can do things with very, very different motives, right? But this was the Lord's um, posture towards his people to whom we were ministering. Okay, fine. We'll stop here. I uh, just want to remind you again, Thursday, you know, before that, just upload the bird study. Uh, let's take a look at uh, what you've done. Okay. Thank you. God bless. See you again. Bye.